time. Um, it says spiritual autobiography, but um, that's, that's a very daunting title, an autobiography. It, it implies like a very complete um, life testimony, but um, today I just wanted to, in the short time I have, just give you a certain slice of my life, how God has really um, just shown me just amazing grace. And the key verse I have for you today is from Isaiah chapter 48, verse 10. Um, it's not up there, but I'll read it to you. It says, Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. And, um, you know, apart from the grace of God, we really are nothing. I, I, I've come to acknowledge this fact. We all say that. As Christians, like we know that's the right thing to say, but to really experience that and to live that out and to live out your public and your private life as though you really believe that is another matter. And, and after I was saved, I, I could say all the right things and I could do all the right things and I could project myself and I could make myself seem like a, like, like a really devout person, but I did not internalize this truth. Apart from the grace of God, I'm nothing, nothing but a seething mass of egotistical flesh, someone who loves to puff himself up, someone who loves to, someone who loves to gain pride and exalt himself at the expense of others. That's who I, I wasn't, and, and, and to some measure I still am. But I want to take you back to uh, the time where I, I had just uh, been saved, and I still didn't grow into this truth yet. And so there was a time in my life where I didn't know this. I didn't have a full sufficiency in Christ. Like, I was saved because I had trusted in Christ. I had repented of my sins. But there was still a very deep root of self-righteousness in me. I was so proud. I had done away with all the external sins. And, and I served in ministry. And I did all these wonderful things. But inside, there was this deep root of pride that God had to remove. And, and how he removed it is um, through the key verse I told you, the furnace of affliction. Deep suffering is how God disciplines us. And so it is very difficult for our poor flesh to suffer, right? Um, young Christians might have a cavalier attitude towards suffering. I know I did. Um, maybe this is more of a guy thing, you know? We, when we're young and when we're very naive, we, we tend to sort of exult in suffering and, and we, you know, we, we kind of glory in physical contact and things like that. And when you look at the history of Christian martyrdom, and if you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, there were martyrs burning alive for Christ and then going to jail, and the Apostle Paul was beheaded, and all these things, seem, and to a naive Christian, you look at that, and, you know, I, I kind of confirm with my friend that he thought this too, because I didn't want to be the only one, but we're like, yeah, that's kind of cool, you know? I, I'd rather like to be like that, I'd rather like to die, um, go out in a blaze of glory, and honor Christ. Um, but this is a very naive view of suffering. Um, this is a extremely just a poor view, an impoverished view of suffering. And so, but I, I wasn't immune to this type of thinking. And, you know, I, I just had dreams uh, when I was first a Christian. Oh, you know, I'd, I'd just go out to some country, um, I'd preach the gospel, and then I'd get my head cut off. Or, uh, or, I'd, or I'd, you know, I'd, burn, I'd be burned at the stake. I mean, I, I'm just being honest, guys, you know. And, um, you know, I'd be ushered into heaven, you know, you know, and the trumpets and fanfare and all that nonsense. I mean, this, this, this embarrassing fantasy is just, uh, is only excused by my young age at the time. But... Um, but, but it was what I thought of suffering, you know, it was only sort of like this, this point system by which I could, you know, gain merit with God and be made a good Christian. And I was so naive, so naive, and so proud. And then um, six years later, um, I went to college and my thinking changed quite dramatically. Um, because I was a sophomore in Korea, and um, I was serving in church, I was doing all the right things, I was the leader, people looked up to me honestly. And, um, you know, all of a sudden, um, the area under, under my ear on the right side, um, it started to grow extremely painful and inflamed. And uh, because I didn't have health insurance overseas in Korea, um, I went to a Korean college, so I, I, was, I, I had no medical, <coughs> medical treatment. Um, I had to rush back here to New York, uh, where my home is, where my family is. And I was informed that my dentist fixed you know, my jaw. Uh, he fixed my teeth like an orthodontist with braces, right? But he fixed it wrongly two years ago. And basically it had been set in an improper bite. And for the over the two years I was in Korea, I had been biting with that wrong bite. And it had totally disarranged my jaw joint. And uh, it's very delicate. There's like a piece of cartilage in there. And it got damaged. Um, and, you know, it's called TMJ. And I don't want to go too much into it. But it's just very painful. Very difficult. 
Um, you spend your, your, your days, you know, kind of panicking. It's hard to treat. There's not many people who treat it. Um, it's very expensive. And I just came back home and, and I just bounced around from doctor to doctor, like trying to find someone who could fix this. There's no one who could fix it. Because it was such a weird case, like this dentist had messed up, you know? And, I mean, I, I, can't, I don't know what to say, but, you know, so every time I moved my jaw, it would like pop out of place, right? And it would cause pain. Um, and, you know, to, to add insult to injury, and I know it sounds funny, but man, for, for a year and a half, like, this was all I could think about. Like, I stayed in my room, I quit school for 18 months, and, and, and I couldn't function. I couldn't eat. Um, I couldn't talk well. I thought I'd never sing again. Um, I sing for church, you know, if you guys don't know, but I, I thought I would never do anything again with my mouth. Um, and, like, I, I started to feel hip and groin pain from the, from the, from the stress. Um, and then, to, just to top this off, like, uh, basically my little sister has had a kidney condition from when she was a very young girl. And it came uh, back, when I came back to Korea, and she started vomiting uncontrollably throughout the night. For months and months and months, and there was, and the hospital couldn't tell us anything. And I, I, I don't know how many nights I spent with my arm around her, but she just vomited into the toilet uncontrollably. And I just, you know, like, I, I've never experienced that depth of pain before, and I hope to never again. Um, but, and, and so I endured this for a while, for like a year and a half. I was just enduring and enduring and enduring, um, bouncing around from doctor to doctor, crying out to God. And then one day I just decided I couldn't take it anymore. I, I couldn't take it anymore. I just came into my room. I remember this night very clearly. I, I turned off the light. I dropped to my knees and I told God, God, if this is how it's going to be, you can just kill me. I cannot live under this suffering. And so how, how things had changed from this cavalier, this immature young man, to, to, to being humbled before my God and admitting that I can't do this. I can't do this. And so the suffering that seemed so doable six years ago, it was now an insurmountable mountain of pain and terror. And it was then that I realized that my body, my health, my success, my college accolades, they had all been an idol to me of my own making. And when they were taken away, I became, I became so resentful, right? But God used it for good. And now the prophet Zechariah writes, and I will bring the third part through the fire, refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. This is Zechariah chapter 13, verse 9. And so in the darkness of my room, uh, alone and broken, uh, for those many months, I called on the name of the Lord. Uh, I discovered in the furnace that Christ was showing me that I was His through discipline, that he was trying to make me more like him. And I would mouth, you are my God, silently to him while clutching my pillow, and the dark nights would slip away into something like hope. And this continued for many months. But thankfully, you know, God resolved most of my ordeals in this grace. I praise God for that. Um, I eventually found a specialist in another state that was able to treat my jaw. And the good urologist in Manhattan um, that I found diagnosed and performed surgery on my sister after many months. And she was able to um, make a recovery. She's still suffering from some after effects, but by and large, she's able to function. I'm so happy and I'm so thankful to God for that. Um, just this time of suffering was over. My hip and my groin pains disappeared after a few months. I don't know why they were there. I don't know why they went away. But uh, I, have, I have a feeling that God has something to do with it. Yes. And I started school again. And I began to exercise again. And I began to eat hard foods again. And I thank God in tears for restoring me. And I was able to see in the fullness of time why he had allowed me to go through such a difficult experience. You see, I needed so badly to be humbled. Right? I was, I was and I still am a very proud person. I constantly use my talents in Korea and other places in the name of ministry to exalt myself and so that I would be admired by other people. Um, while I was a genuine Christian, I was very immature. I was consumed with worldly things while a battle for souls raged all around me. I was not fit to become a servant of God. And it was so necessary for me to go through that doorstep of grief 
it was so necessary for me to become more like Christ through the, through the pain. Um, and I had to go through the bitter weeping that Peter went through, the Apostle Peter, when he realized how badly his confidence had reflected his character. In John chapter 18, verse 13 to 27, Jesus, I will die for you. Three hours later, I don't know this man. I don't know this man. That was me in a nutshell. And so I had to realize in the pain how inadequate I really was. And then I also discovered that my faith had been very weak. I thought it was so strong, but it was so weak. I found that after the tears had dried, and even after all these pains had gone away, that I was filled with incredible resentment against the Lord. Because for 18 months, I, I just had questions for God. Why did you rip me away from my education in Korea? And why am I going to this backwater college near my house? Why was I set back almost two years? Um, why did he keep me bedridden for so long? while my friends were traveling the world and posting you know, selfies to their Instagram accounts. Um, that's what we do when you're alone and you're sick and you, know, you look through Instagram. And, you know, it's, very, it's a very troubling experience. Um, but, you know, and I would just peer through swollen eyes um, with the yellowness of my room alone. And I would just wonder, you know, God, why me? Um, was there a purpose to this? Do you have my greatest good in mind? Do you care about me at all? And so, I remember wrestling with these questions one night um, as I gazed at my Bible. Um, it's a small Bible. It's back there, actually. I should have brought it up, but it's a, it's a very small uh, in a leather made tome, and it lay on my desk, and, and I hadn't opened it in days. I was just angry at God. You know when you're angry at God and you don't want to go to the Bible? Everyone knows this. Everyone knows. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and I hadn't opened it because, and I tried to fill my time with other things. You know, I'm at, I'm at home, I'm alone, I can't do anything. Might as well just play computer games. You know? Might as well as, um, you know, try to read, try to write, try to write creative stories, um, foolish things. And nothing had worked. And the, the anguish and the desperation uh, over my loss had only grown greater and greater and greater. And so, um, more out of desperation than anything, I just opened my Bible. Open it and it opens Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And I began reading it with something like apathy. Um, it was a weight of hopelessness on my chest and it was cold and heavy as it had ever been. And then I'll never forget this moment, but all of a sudden I just I just burst into tears. I just spontaneously I just burst into tears I was reading. Because um, as I had been steadily imbibing these great promises that are in Romans chapter 8, right? My eye had lit on this verse, verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to His purpose. And that verse just hit me like a thunderclap. Um, you know, I, I literally remember my chest just twisting inside. And because I had completely forgotten that God loved me, in suffering, we tend to forget that God still truly loves us, that he sent Christ to die for us, that, that the sacrifice has not been invalidated because we seem to be in, in pain. And he had been work, using, watching over me in my suffering to use it for my good. And so how faithless I was, I realized then, how faithless, I couldn't trust him. He had sent his only son to die for my sins and to be butchered on the cross. And I couldn't even trust him over these things. I lost my faith in him so quickly. And so for a few hours afterwards, you know, I just wept and I asked God, Lord, please forgive me for losing my trust in you and in your son. And it was just a cathartic and a wonderful moment. And for a few hours all afterwards, all I could think of was, I'm back. I'm finally back to Jesus. I'm back. Amen. And he tenderly restored me. And now I came out of the furnace with two valuable lessons. The first was that I was weak. I realized that my faith was nothing. And this is a lesson that every Christian has to go through. Your faith is nothing. Apart from the grace of God and, and, the, and, the, and the supply of the Holy Spirit, our faith is nothing. And I realized that I was capable of falling away from God if I was left on my own. My self-sufficiency was torn away. And I bore the curse of Adam just as well as anybody. But the second lesson, the second lesson was so much happier and so much greater. It was that God's love for me was greater than I had ever imagined. Because the Lord proved his devotion to me in an undeniable way. 
by remaining faithful to me when I could not be faithful to him. Right? And that's what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. If we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. And so the memory of my pain now serves as a priceless reminder that God will not stop loving and caring for me no matter what the future holds. And now, I don't know how much time I have, but I just want to quickly go through um, this verse that impacted me so much. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. I feel like this verse is subject to a lot of misinterpretation, right? Sometimes we apply it to material things, you know, we lose a mortgage, we even lose a loved one. And we just limit our perspective to this life, and we say, in this life, in the future, in the days ahead, surely there will be good through this. And that's true, but the verse has a second part to it. It's not just that all things will work together for our good, but it says that all things will work together for good for those who are called according to God's purpose. And so it's, that promise is based on the purpose. There's an underlying bedrock of purpose that that promise functions on. And that purpose is given in the next verse, verse 29. It says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. In order that he, Jesus Christ, might become the firstborn, or the prototokos, the preeminent one among many brothers. It is for the glory of God, it is for the glory of Jesus Christ, that we are to be subjected to this wonderful promise in verse 28. When we say all things will work together for our good, it is because God promises from before the beginning of time to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. To strip us away from our sins, to remove self-sufficiency and pride from us, to humble us, and to make us like Him. So that we can walk like Jesus walked, so we can talk like Jesus talked, and so in doing so, we would be His brothers, and that He would be, because He is among the like-minded people whom He has redeemed, that He would be the preeminent one among them. That Jesus Christ would be glorified. That's the promise of God in verse 28. Yes, we're going through hard times. Life is difficult. But the promise extends beyond this life. Some of us are going to have very miserable lives. My father had a very miserable life, full of failures from a worldly perspective. My mother, our home is racked with, 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 with all sorts of evil. But my hope is not in this life. And my hope for you guys, especially the young, young ones, I know this, you haven't grasped this yet. Not many of you. And it'll take so much suffering and discipline. But the hope is, the hope is that you will set your sights not on this life, but on the life to come in glorifying Christ in the life to come by becoming like Him, by humbling yourself, by submitting to the Lord, by losing your self-sufficiency in yourself, saying, just like Jeremiah said, the Lord is my righteousness. The Lord is my righteousness. And um, I don't know how much time I have left, but I just want to go through uh, one more. Am I okay, Pastor David? Am I okay? All right. Okay. Because, <laughs> okay. I, I mean, this, this happened. Like, I wasn't going to talk about what I wanted to talk about, but this just happened the other day. And so, I was talking to um, one of our um, young uh, students. Uh, I'll just say her name, Ruthie. And, um, and uh, she's, a, one, she's, she's much more advanced than I was at her age, but um, she was talking about some of her disappointments. In, uh, in, in college and stuff, and and I just I just had to step in at that point because she wasn't resentful towards God like I was, but you know there was some disappointment, so I had to step in and I had to say, I told her this and I'll tell you this now, I was rejected from all the colleges I applied to, and then I was accepted into a bunch of other colleges, a bunch of high rank colleges that I tried to transfer to, and God shut the door on everyone, every single one, and I was so disappointed because if you have Asian parents you know, you know <laughs> understand that they I mean and they will just heap like they don't mean to. My dad didn't mean to but man, it made me feel so terrible. And I was just so I was like I was like dad like it's because of the money, you know it's, I got in, you know, and he's just like you have to become a skilled person, what are you gonna do now for the future? And uh, and I told my father and I learned through the disappointment, I said, Dad I've decided to, you know, I've decided to live for the glory of Christ. I could not care less about a college degree. I could not care less about the standards of this world. In fact, if the college degree, if God sends you to Harvard in order to glorify Him, so be it. But if God sends you to a community college and you defy Him and you, and you go to somewhere else, that's idolatry. 
You just want to be a, a big name. You just want to be someone you know, who has a, a title. You want self-respect. You want insurance. You want a nice home. But what God wants for us is, verse 29, to be conformed to the image of His Son. I wish we would remember that, guys. I wish we would remember this. That the promise in verse 28 is connected to verse 29. That we would not separate the two. But that we would set our sights on Christ. And that we would be conformed to His image. Amen. Amen. Amen.